Uh, I'm on the Chrome team. I, I've been at Google. I, I joined in 2005. I was there for many years. I left. I actually came back two years ago to specifically work on this particular project. I'm quite uh, interested in it. And it, it all came from a, something I noticed a couple years ago, which is the fact that we have more and more smart devices that we're all seeing around, and each one of them has their own smart app. And that's, of course, totally understandable. That's how this kind of thing has to work right now. But it's, if we believe in Moore's law at all, where are we going with this? And what's going to happen in six months? And what's going to happen in 12 months? And are we really going to have smart apps for absolutely everything? And this is especially true in the public space, where you want to use something in a mall or an airport, where you're not going to be installing the vending machine app as you walk past it. So for those types of lightweight situations, how can we make this happen? Because to a certain extent, the superpower of the web is the fact that it has interaction on demand. You can literally go to any experience on the planet with just a tap. It's just a tap away. And I think that's kind of useful for the Internet of Things and smart devices. So how could we like make that happen? Because over the last, say, 30 years, we've gotten very excited by the DOM, the document object model of the web. And we've spent, spent all of our energy doing really cool things inside of that box. There's no question that's really powerful, but we've hardly done anything at all for this little box at the top. This URL bar, we have to type something in. I mean, we're going to go anywhere. We've got to kind of dub, 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 you know, cnn.com, and that's kind of silly. We've taken the most amazing rendering engine on the planet, and we've slapped a damn DOS prompt on top of it, which just seems really weird. And it's like, really, why can't the web on mobile start to take advantage of the sensors that have been there for an awful long time? So. The Chrome team basically feels that the web needs a discovery service. Why must you be on your mobile phone? And if you want to go to a website, you actually have to type something in. That's just right out of the 1980s. So that seems really kind of strange. So the idea would be is, let's say there's three things in the environment, a bus stop, a parking meter, and a vending machine, and you wanted to actually interact with one of them, what would you have to do? Well, if each one is broadcasting a URL, and we'd like to imagine there's many technologies that can do this, but let's just for the moment stick with Bluetooth Low Energy. And it was finding that beacon, uh, and you were to walk into that space, what would happen? Now, we could just take the URLs and just give you a list of them, but as, and URLs are really important for transparency and domains and so forth, but it's not quite enough. What you'd like to be able to have is like the, a title and a little snippet and maybe a little a icon to explain what you're picking. And then once you actually got that, you would then, of course, just take you to the website. It's really that lightweight. The idea is to discover and show and go as quickly as you possibly can. And how this would work is right now, for the V1 version that we're doing, is it's just using Bluetooth Low Energy. We're just broadcasting in the advertising packet of the beacon. This is a standard part of Bluetooth Low Energy. It just broadcasts a URL in the advertising packet over and over and over again. And then what would happen, of course, is that your phone would have a simple scanner that would say, I, I, I know what that is. I can show that to you and then give a little list to the user. Um, it's really just that simple. There's a, it's a very tiny bit of technology that we're trying to do here. And that's effectively all that the physical web is, is this bridge between physical and the, and the web. So you walk up to a parking meter. It's broadcasting the URL. You can then kind of see it, and in you go. But what people, I don't think, appreciate sometimes is to how simple this idea is. We're not really asking for much. We just want things to have their own web pages. But it's just a web page. And so people are so used to having like a big portal that millions of people go to as opposed to a device, a web page for every device. It's kind of flipping the whole problem on its head. And the idea is that you would literally be able to walk up and use anything, whether it would be a vending machine, a parking meter, a, a movie poster. It could even be a lost dog collar if you want it to be. Every device has this virtual note card of just more information. But the critical thing is that we've so imprinted upon existing beacon solutions that we assume that this must beep in your pocket. This must be some kind of vibration. And anybody who remembers Bluetooth Classic in the 1990s that had Bluetooth messaging realizes that that was a really bad idea because the spammers got a hold of it and ruined it for everybody. We can't have this thing vibrate because it's a universal system. You'd walk into a mall and your phone would like jump out of your pocket. It'd be so kind of on fire with notifications. So this can only work if the user pulls their phone out and says, show me the things around. We have to respect the user's attention here and only do it when they ask for it. It's a big difference from previous models. So the idea is pretty simple in the sense that you just have a device that broadcasts a URL and it takes you to the cloud. 
That's really it. But I always get two questions right away, right off the bat, so I'll just save you guys, because this is only going to be 15 minutes, and I want 15 minutes of questions. The first question I always get is, well, isn't this just a QR code? Come on. Like, well, technically, yes, it's a QR code. I like to think of it as a really awesome QR code. It's a little bit different because the intention, of course, is that with the QR code, you have to like see one thing at a time, and you actually have to get close and do that. Whereas here, you can see a dozen, or multiple dozens of things at the same time. Or more importantly, instead of it being on top of the object, it could literally be you know, 50 meters away. So it's a whole different usage case. Also, QR codes are, are popular in a couple countries, but they tend to be unused things like receipts, and advertising in magazines or posters. There's a very limited use case where they work. You would not put a QR code on a light bulb or a toaster or a refrigerator. It just doesn't make sense. The other question I get all the time is, is it won't this generate spam? If this is the web and anybody can take a URL and anybody can slap it over anywhere, it's going to be just chaos. And I'm like, well, it's kind of the web. And the web is kind of chaotic. But we have a way of dealing with this. We basically grab all the URLs around you, and we don't show them directly to the user for two reasons. One is we don't want to contact each website directly. That could, the user could be fingerprinted. That would be a leak of privacy. So we have to protect the user, and we put them all through a proxy. And the proxy then can then contact on the user's behalf, which protects them. But it also allows us to run a spam filter on it, and a phishing filter, and kind of get rid of the low-hanging fruit. Also, right now, we are encouraging only HTTPS domains, which vastly gets rid of a lot of the low-hanging fruit as well. So it helps effectively kind of train the chaos a little bit. We are built on top of Eddystone. Eddystone is the underlying beacon format you've probably heard 75 times in the last two days. And there's three classic formats, the UID, the telemetry, and the URL. We're using the URL packet. And we just pack a URL inside. We have a simple compression scheme to get to get rid of some of the obvious things, so like HTTPS colon slash slash www dot is one byte. It's a form of just simple you know, encoding. But that's what we're built on top of. We are the scanner on top of Eddystone URL. So what we're trying to create is effectively two clouds, a cloud of devices that are broadcasting URLs in a very standard format. So everybody's broadcasting URLs in the same way. And then a whole range of scanners. Now, right now, there are no scanners. It's just us, and we're building it. But that's why we're doing this open source. I, I loved coming back to Google to the Chrome team, because the Chrome team is just filled with Boy Scouts who just want to do the right thing for the web. And so the beacon code is open source. The scanner is open source. The proxy is open source. We want there to be lots and lots of people scanning and showing the physical web. It's not our job to be our product. We're just kind of kickstarting this new open web format. So we will be the first one we hope to get people excited, but already there are two or three other companies making their own scanners, and we're like super excited that that's happening. So let me give you an example. I've talked an awful lot. Uh, here's a couple of examples of products that you could build. So what we're doing right now is showing a Happy Meal toy, and it is using the physical web to get to the web page. But because there's a new W3C standard that uses JavaScript to speak Bluetooth, it allows you to actually connect to the toy and control it directly. So here's how it happens. We're using the physical web to find it. And there we see, right there, Tuga the Turtle. We click it. Now, the physical web's done. We're now classic web at this point. It shows you the web page. Now you can actually control it by picking various things. You make it happy or silly or grumpy. You kind of choose its personality, and the color changes. And you can't tell, but it's vibrating and changing. Or you can change the actual color. And the whole idea is that you're kind of configuring this for your child. You put the phone away, and now it's got its own personality. You turn it upside down, and it gets all grumpy, and it vibrates. We had way too much fun building this. We actually had to stop, because we weren't really building physical web anymore. We were building a toy. Um, but it shows you how fun it is to build this kind of stuff. And this could be built for a couple bucks. It'd be really inexpensive to do. And it's just using a device that has Bluetooth and a, couple, a little GAT service to it. No internet connectivity of any kind. Now, this is probably our most aggressive concept because it uses all the latest cool stuff. We've got a product sending a Bluetooth beacon to me. I'm going to the web, and I'm getting a web page with this new web Bluetooth JavaScript library, which is, by the way, a W3C standard. And then you can then talk right back to the device. But what people like about it is that there's no cloud here, right? The device is just talking directly to me. I need the cloud to get the web page, but that's just one time shot to get that. 
Now the flip side, the completely different way of thinking about this is to do what we'll call classic web, which is imagine, say, for example, a bus stop that's broadcasting a URL, and I go to the cloud, and I just get a web page. That is not a smart bus stop. It's a concrete pole, in, you know, it's a pole of concrete. It just gives, simply just gives me some information. Simple, it's lightweight, and we feel like this unlocks all sorts of really interesting things that you can do. But it's, this is what I mean by having this virtual note card, whether it's a movie poster or anything like that. It can be really interesting. But what we also discovered was kind of almost a surprise that there's so much going on with the web. It's getting so much better. It's making us look awesome, and we don't deserve it at all. There's just a lot of really cool web technologies that are coming on top of it. So for example, if you've heard of Service Worker that's coming, also another standard, it allows you to sign up for push notifications, which the user opts in to being able to be beeped at a later time. So in this particular case, I'll show you this restaurant buzzer. I'll flip over here. So you pull down the manager and you see Bob's Deli. Again, physical web, done. That was like four seconds, right? We're now on a web page that says, hey, there's eight people in front of you, take a number. You've now signed up for a push notification, you turn off the phone, you put it in your pocket. Then what happens is, it's your turn in line at the deli. It sends you a push notification, your phone beeps, Bob's Deli, and in you go. Now in this case, it did vibrate in your pocket, but you opted in, you asked for it, it's a big difference. And again, the physical web is identical for both the turtle and the restaurant. It's just the web made it more awesome and do that on top of it. And the last one I want to talk about is cloud pass-through. And this is now maybe more of a developer difference. It's not really the same. I mean, from the user experience point of view, you're walking to a device and you're using it, but it's fun to explore the plumbing differences. In this case, the, the smart parking meter sends you a URL, you go to the cloud, and then the cloud actually talks directly to that device. It's just using web sockets. It's just pushing event to the device. So here's how this would work. Uh, here's a parking meter we made. I'm pulling down the notification manager. I just see the fact that it's pay at parking right in front of me, and I click it. Again, physical web is done. Now at this particular point, the parking meter is on the internet. It has its own connectivity, separate from the phone. I go up, up, and the number goes up. I hit pay, it authorizes it, and it goes, and we're done. Whenever I show this in San Francisco, people just cry a little bit. <laughs> because we, you know, we have that, pay, that parking system here, and nobody ever can figure out how to use it, right? Now, I will admit I cheated a little bit here because I'd already used it once before, so it knew what, whatever my payment system was. And people always ask, well, are you using Google Pay? I don't care. It's the web. Pick your payment system. It's just simply whatever web system that you want to have. But once you had that in place, it literally would be that many clicks and you'd be done. So what I want to stress one critical point here, though, that what we're talking about with the physical web is the ability for you to find the URL on the phone and then take you to a web page. That's our job. It's effectively just the really awesome QR code side of things. Everything else that you saw was the web. I've gotten asked many times, Scott, what's your SDK? And I like kind of going, well, I don't have one. Because we, we don't. It's just, it's, we, just, we just get you to a web page. It's up to you to go from there. We don't have an SDK. It's just simply you just take a beacon and slap it up and you're done. So the intention is that an, a lot of times when I show people the, the cloud pass through, they're like, yeah, but come on. Are you really going to have a device that's connected to the internet? I'm like, you have heard of the Internet of Things, right? I mean, you can get, effectively, GSM modems now from a company called Particle that's like 39 bucks, right? And it has GSM connectivity, and it gets 10,000 messages a month. I mean, it's not a big deal now to make a device that's connected to the Internet that gets messages. So what I think is going to be very likely over the next year or two is that devices will have their connectivity, I'll have my connectivity, and we'll be in a public space. There's no way we're on the same network. The idea that we're going to be in the same subnet is totally appropriate for enterprise and home. I'm not saying, you know, but in public spaces, you're not going to be connecting to its Wi-Fi so you can talk to it. It doesn't make any sense. You just simply want to have a URL to say, just meet me over here. Just, I'll just meet you over there, and that's fine. It's, so it's really meant to be a lightweight way to kind of rendezvous kind of in the cloud. We also found out that as we were playing is the first thing I built, I don't know if you guys saw this, but the first thing I did was I built a vending machine. I bought it on Craigslist, carried it in the office, I ripped the guts out, put it in our uh, Raspberry Pi, hooked it all up, and, um, and everybody loved it. It's fun to have this kind of vending machine work. But it was quite clear that we were thinking kind of like classic control stuff model. It, we actually got much smaller. It was like this idea of bus stops, I told you, or movie posters. But these are still corporate ideas. 
The more we've played with it, the more we realize it unlocks all sorts of really interesting personal consumer use cases. So imagine, for example, that you're giving, we're actually writing an extension right now for Chrome OS, so when you're presenting Google Slides, you're just presenting the, the URL to everyone else in the room, so they can also see your slides. It's a one-time thing that happens for 30 minutes, and that's just done. Or the fact that you could put this on a dog collar, and normally it would just simply be a dog collar. I'm Sparky, hi, I'm, you know, but, but if your dog were to be lost, you'd call, and the web page would change, and it says, I was lost at 7.15, and call this number, it could be the Humane Society or whatever, and it'd be like a, a, a system to help you find your dog. It's just a web page to help you find your dog, or even a for sale sign. You can take a for sale sign from the back of your car, but it could also link to photos of the car, records, service records, and so forth. It just adds a, a richness and a depth to things. So we feel this unlocks an awful lot, especially because these beacons are getting so inexpensive. So the web is famous for this long tail of content. You know, like the bottom 99% of the web is bigger than the 1% type of thing because there's just so many cool little things. Every example I showed you today, from vending machines to bus stops to luggage or toasters, is, is kind of, meh, it's okay, but taken together, it forms what we're kind of calling the long tail of interaction. It's the fact that you could literally interact with almost anything in a very lightweight way. And I want to stress that it doesn't require the IoT. People often think the physical web is the IoT, and it's like, well, actually, we're just the UX gateway. We get you to that. Because, for example, I could can talk to a toaster. I mean, so many people take toasters or any device and they unpack it from the box and it's got URLs and QR codes all over it and you unpack it and you throw the box away. And some poor marketer loses his wings, <laughs> right? Because they just, this, this opportunity has been lost, right? Well, imagine that that, you, that URL can now live inside the toaster and you could, you know, if you're just going to push insurance on them, that's ridiculous. But if you were to have how to clean the crumb tray and the recipe of the week and how to recycle it, you could actually add value to this toaster. It'd be quite interesting. And it's still just a dumb toaster. There's no IoT involved whatsoever. It's just engagement with the user. So we feel like there's an awful lot of value to the physical web outside of the IoT. So we announced about, what, 15 months ago on GitHub, we're one of the Google's most popular <coughs> GitHub repos. We feel very strongly about being open source. As I said before, the beacon, the scanner, the, the server, it's all open source, and it's quite active. People are asking lots of questions. Um, it's also quite exciting, the fact that Opera has already announced they've got a scanner. I bumped into somebody today, uh, Blinks. They're working on their own scanner. This makes us very excited, because this has to be a part of the web. It can't succeed if it's exclusively a Google product. It only will succeed if we, as a community, want it to succeed, which is why I come out and talk about this so much. It's just part of the generic open web that anybody can be a part of. So we announced at Chrome Dev Summit about last month that we are shipping physical web in Chrome, but just to kind of kickstart the market. Uh, if you happen to have Chrome on your iOS machine right now, you have the physical web, and you just didn't know it. All you have to do is open up the Today View and turn on the Chrome widget, and you'll see the beacons that we're broadcasting around you right now. I'm seeing people diving right now. It's kind of cool. Um, we are in Chrome for Android in the dev build, uh, which means you've got to go turn on a flag and reboot the machine. It's a little bit more for developers. Um, we are working very quickly to kind of get it into public release. It should be coming out this quarter, and we're very excited for that coming. That should really, we think, unlock an awful lot more. We have a much better onboarding experience with Android as well, because what we're going to be able to do is vibrate when you're nearby a beacon one time, and say, oh, can I turn on the physical web? There's something nearby. And the user can say no. But if they say yes, we will then opt them into the physical web and they'll get them up and running. We think that's going to be a much better experience. And we hope by getting the hundreds of millions of Android users working this, this is going to really help quite a bit. So this is taking off right now. And um, we're hoping that, say, like I said, by the beginning of the second quarter, it'll be a lot more activity for you guys to play with. So I, I tried very hard to keep this to 15 minutes. I got 15 minutes more to go. This usually engenders tons of questions. So I wanted to wrap up, say thank you for your time, and take some questions. <laughs> yes, sir. So how does Chrome prevent uh, the agents from the first order from sniffing the uh, packet? What? Uh, one of these beacons in a bank or whatever, uh, and fish your Chrome, and find a BB-8, well, as I mentioned before, we, we take many, many steps, right? So 
We make sure, for example, that we're only using the, scan pa the, the advertising packet or the scan response packet that protects you from malicious beacons. Then we make sure that we use a proxy service to make sure it contacts the website that prevents you from being fingerprinted. We then use a, a uh, filter service to make sure that all malicious websites that we can detect are removed. And then we open it up inside the browser, which has its own sandbox. So we take multiple steps along the way. And, and HTTPS, by the way, prevents any man-in-the-middle attacks. The, uh, beacon communicating to the, uh, your smartphone. Yeah. How do you verify that this is uh, authentic, that this beacon? We, we don't. It's just a URL. Well, we would, our, our proxy service would then re remove that phishing URL from your list, assuming we can detect it. I mean, it's, by the way, I, wanna, I don't want to guarantee it. It's always, it's always an acceleration, but there, there will, anybody who says 100% guarantee is clearly selling you something, yeah. right? So you can't do that. Yeah. Have any other Beacon platforms taken it up? Beacon, well, we're based on top of Eddystone, and so there's, what, 18 to 25, depending on your count. Beacon manufacturers that are doing this, and they're all the feedback we've been getting is really strong because they've tried the kind of the classic approach before, and they find it's just really hard to get small company apps to be installed. And so once anybody can kind of go into a store and get an experience without installing an app, they're like pretty excited by that. So, like anything, I think it's going to be a chicken or the egg. So we're talking to a lot of um, advanced. Uh, uh, ad agencies, experimental places. As soon as we, I think once we ship on Chrome to 800 million phones, I think a lot more people will get started. But let's be clear, it's going to take a little while for the ecosystem to grow. Yeah? I got super excited about this, and uh, I noticed in our little kit that we got, uh, it came with a Bluetooth beacon. That's correct. That is a Blue Vision beacon. You need to use the Beeks app, B-E-E-K-S. And then when you install that application, it will allow you to set it. Each beacon manufacturer at this point has its own application to set it. And we are actually working on trying to make that a more unified experience. We hope to tell you more about that in the next quarter. Because obviously being able to set them in a more uh, uniform way would be a very useful thing to do. We've heard loud and clear from people. We need to improve that. Yes, sir. Well, if you open up physical, you'll see it right now. <laughs> I, uh, uh, we have, I mean, right now, I think the beacons that you'll see will be to the agenda, to this, and then one to the physical web. And there's one, I think, to the front page. So you should be able to see at least three beacons right now. And I always carry one in my pocket to my blog just because I'm a selfless, shameless self-promoter. Yeah. yeah. And by the way, we, uh, we do not recommend I mean, the, the, the huge power of the physical web right now is primarily in ephemeral public interaction. A number of people have thought this is a great idea to put on badges and for people to carry around. Well, you, now you're, you're basically advertising yourself and walking around with a very uniform fingerprint that can be tracked. So um, that if you want to do something that's, uh, that's very personal attached to people, then you'd probably be wanting to go to the ephemeral ID standard, a very different thing, a new packet for Eddie Stone. This primarily should be attached to public things for ephemeral lightweight information that's safe and public and open. It just takes a lot of the risk out of it. Yes? What about <coughs> power engagement? Um, are you just limited to public things that have power already? So the question is about powering beacons. Um, beacons are changing so radically. Um, the beacons I was using a year ago uh, were half as efficient as the ones I'm using right now. So we've got a beacon right now that's about this big with a CR2475 in it, and it lasts for three years. And once you get past two years, people don't seem to care anymore. Um, and yet, the, these are basically the, what, 2.4 volt. Um, there's already been an announcement of one volt chips, which will last almost three times longer. So we really do expect that the battery issue is almost going to go away within probably 18 months. Uh, I was just at CES. There's a company called Beco that basically has a small device that clips to um, fluorescent lights, and they have a PV cell inside, so, and that gives it more than enough power. So you clip it, and as long as the lights are on, it runs forever. So there's quickly changing this idea. Uh, keep in mind, by the way, that the Bluetooth standard is changing from 4.2 to 5, which will become more prevalent probably this fall. So in a year and a half to two years, most people are going to probably want to change out the beacons to the new standard anyway. So I think and by the time we get to 5, 
you, easy to imagine these beacons lasting, if not five years indefinitely. More power Significantly more power efficiency, yeah. We've definitely noticed that it's changed an awful lot, that initially a lot of these, these systems, these SOCs would, would take a tremendous amount of power to power up, and then the broadcasting would be a much less version, you know, smaller part of it, but now what we're seeing is they're so efficient, they power up quickly and lightly, and most of the power is the actual transmission, which is a good sign. It means they're getting much more efficient. The range is really up to you as far as how much power you want to pump into it and the antenna. If you're willing to plug it into a wall and put a big antenna, this sucker can go 100 yards, 100 meters. But most of these systems are going to be like, say, 30 to 40 feet um, if you want to have it last for a long time. But we do little, by the way, we do, we do simple little things, which is like in this particular case, we've blanketed this place with about four beacons, all broadcasting the same URL. When you pull out our scanner, we may see three of those four URLs but we'll dedupe them and only show you the one, right? And that makes it really easy for you to just kind of wantonly kind of scatter them around just to make sure you get coverage, but you'll just see the one URL in the scanner. Little things like that are nice. Okay, we're all set? Okay, that's the time. And I'll be outside if you have any questions. Thanks very much.